welcome to the 31st lecture in our particle characterization course. In the previous uh, lecture, we have looked at various methods of synthesis of nanoparticles. Uh, initially, we discussed bottom up approaches and uh, later we started reviewing methods for making nanoparticles by a top down approach, which is where you start with particles that are larger in size and then fragment them to smaller dimensions. Uh, in particular, we looked at high energy ball milling as a method that can be used for making fine particles. However, uh, the mechanism involved in, in a ball mill is such that as particle size gets smaller and smaller, it becomes increasingly more difficult and energy inefficient to produce additional surface area. So we introduced the method of uh, sono fragmentation, which is the use of an acoustic field which is coupled to a liquid medium and the propagation of this acoustic field in the liquid produces uh, st standing waves that are characterized by compression and rarefaction cycles. And essentially in an acoustic field, you form bubbles during the rarefaction phase which are compressed and which implode during the compression phase. And as they do, they release a large amount of energy in the form of a shock wave. And when this shock wave impacts on a particle, it can actually cause it to shatter, producing many fine particles. The other mechanism is that uh, one particle can be accelerated and made to impact on another particle. And the combined effect of these two mechanisms is to produce smaller particles starting from a feed size that is considerably larger. So we were reviewing some data from this process of top-down um, method of nanoparticle synthesis and we'll continue, continue to do that in this lecture. So one of the key parameters is particle concentration and its effect on sono fragmentation efficiency. If you plot the size reduction characteristics against the feed particle concentration, you see that there is an interesting behavior that happens which is that the mean size actually is reduced to the greatest extent at some intermediate value of particle concentration. If the concentration is lower or higher than this optimal value, then size reduction is reduced. And the reason for this is because there are two mechanisms involved in sono fragmentation. Initially, as particle concentration increases, the particle to particle distance decreases. And therefore, the probability of one particle impacting on another increases. So essentially, an increase in particle concentration leads to an increase in fragmentation efficiency. However, above a certain threshold concentration, the particle mass loading in the liquid becomes so high that the cavitation field itself is dampened or suppressed. And so you start seeing the reverse effect, whereas particle concentration increases, the fragmentation efficiency decreases. So there is an optimum value of um, particle concentration at which the fragmentation efficiency is a maximum. However, if you look at the uh, submicron fraction percentage, uh, which is plotted on the right hand side vertical axis, you will see that this behavior is much more monotonic in nature and that as particle concentration increases, we continue to see an increase in the percentage of particles that are reduced to a submicron size range. The effect of frequency on sono fragmentation is fairly obvious. As frequency increases, as we have discussed earlier, there is a drop in cavitation intensity which scales as 1 over f cubed. So as the frequency increases, there is a very rapid drop in cavitation intensity and there is an accompanying reduction in the rate at which particles are fragmented and this is shown in this particular case. Power also has a linear relationship to fragmentation. As you increase the power of the acoustic field, that is the input power or amplitude, there is a corresponding increase in size reduction efficiency. And therefore, essentially by using higher power ultrasound, you can get additional breakdown of particles by the fragmentation mechanism. And in this case, what we are plotting is time versus size reduction efficiency. And here you see that as the time increases, the reduction in, in particle size keeps increasing, particularly when you use a surfactant. Now the use of a surfactant is very critical for two reasons. 
One is that the surfactant can actually coat on the nanoparticles that are produced and keep them from agglomerating. As we have discussed in earlier lectures, particle cohesion is a major phenomenon in nanoparticle suspensions. And by coating the particle with a suitable substance, you can essentially make the particles repel each other in suspension and keep them from agglomerating. So if you look, compare these two graphs, one with surfactant and the other without surfactant, without the surfactant, the fragmentation rate is eventually equaled or exceeded by the rate of agglomeration. So even though you may be fragmenting the particles by ultrasound, they will reattach or, or re-agglomerate. And therefore, there is no sustained particle reduction beyond a certain time. However, with the use of surfactant, as you increase the amount of sonication time, you will see that the size reduction keeps increasing, although the rate of size reduction does tend to reach a saturation point. Now, in terms of characterizing these particles that are produced by sono fragmentation, uh, microscopy is obviously a very useful technique. Now, to look at the feed alumina particles, optical microscopy is sufficient since these are in the micron size range. Uh, the feed uh, cons particle size here is in the 74 micron range. However, after sono fragmentation, you really cannot see the particles anymore using optical microscopy. As we have discussed earlier, optical microscopy is limited by its magnification. Even the best optical microscopes that are available today can produce only about a 1,000 X magnification, which is still not sufficient for us to be able to see and resolve nanodimensional particles. So then you resort to techniques like SEM and TEM. And the pictures below show TEM images of white fused alumina particles that have been exposed to 30 minutes of sono fragmentation at 20 kilohertz and 500 watt input power. And you can see that there is a substantial size reduction. Many of the particles that you see in the picture are in the micron to submicron range. And also the level of agglomeration is not very significant, although the, the picture on the, on the right hand side shows increased agglomeration. One of the advantages of the ultrasonic method of size reduction is that unlike ball milling, which actually promotes agglomeration, the mechanism of sono fragmentation provides for simultaneous dispersion. So as you are reducing size, you're also dispersing the particles. So the extent of agglomeration that you see is significantly less in sono fragmentation method of top-down nanoparticle synthesis compared to various other methods that are in use. Another interesting effect of sono fragmentation has to do with shape. As we discussed in the first lecture, the two most significant characteristics of particles are size and shape from a morphology viewpoint. And in the previous uh, SEM pictures, we saw the effect of fragmentation on size. Here we are looking at its effect on sphericity. It turns out that when you expose particles that are crystalline in their structure to sono fragmentation, they become increasingly rounded. So sono fragmentation actually has the effect of increasing the sphericity of the particles. So here we are plotting particle sphericity in the three different conditions, before sonication, after 30 minutes sonication, and after 15 minutes sonication. And you can see that the particles that before sonication were very low in their sphericity index, eventually reach virtually 1.0 on their sphericity index after 30 minutes of sonication. Here the sphericity is being defined as essentially an L by D ratio, which is a reasonably simple and straightforward representation of particle shape. Uh, the biggest limitation of it, of course, is that it essentially reduces a three-dimensional object like a particle to its two-dimensional representation. But conventionally, L by D ratios are, have been accepted as measures of sphericity or elongation. So when we look at 15 particles at random and the data are plotted in this graph, you can see that out of the 15 particles, about more than half of them are perfectly spherical after 30 minutes of sonication 
even though before you began the sonication, virtually none of them were spherical in shape. So this rounding off effect could be an advantage of this, uh, of this technique depending on the application. There are certain nano applications where rounded particles are preferred over elongated particles and there are applications where that is not such a good thing. So you have to match the technique of synthesis to the application at hand and in this case shape analysis is, uh, is an important aspect of determining what process to use. These are more high resolution TEM pictures of nano dimensional particles produced using sono fragmentation. This was done with a probe type fragmenter at 20 kilohertz frequency and 1 kilowatt input power and essentially by using these high resolution TEM pictures we have been able to confirm that we are producing a large number of particles that are in the nanometer dimensions. And here are some more pictures of the nano particles that are produced by the method of sono fragmentation. Now one of the important considerations for engineers and again as I mentioned earlier what differentiates nano science from nano technology is our ability to scale up to commercial volumes. It is not enough if we produce enough material to play with in the lab. It has to be something that can be produced and shipped to the market in large enough quantities that it actually makes a difference to a large number of consumers. For that scale up is a very important consideration. Now when we look at this method of sono fragmentation it actually lends itself very well to scale up. The reason is that when we do sonication we are producing a variety of particle sizes. Many of the particles are getting size reduced to submicron and nano dimensions and many particles that are not impacted directly by the ultrasonic energy will remain as micron size particles. So if you can combine this sonicator setup with some kind of a beaker decantation type of arrangement which will continuously separate the size reduced nano dimensional and submicron particles from the micron sized feed particles and set up a recirculation recycle loop where the coarse particles are continuously fed back into the sonication bath. In concept you can actually set up a continuous flow process or at least a semi continuous process to make nanoparticles and to separate them by size using a combination of sono fragmentation and beaker decantation. So in the case of a continuous process what we would do is essentially have a solution that contains these feed particles, expose them to ultrasonics and convert a fraction of them to nano and submicron dimensions and drain these off into a collector and capture them for subsequent use whereas the larger particles that are not yet size reduced will sink to the bottom of this container just because of gravity and sedimentation. So they can be taken out from the bottom and recycled back into the sonication chamber and size reduced further. So you can imagine that this type of a simple setup can be easily fabricated to produce a continuous stream of nano and submicron size particles which can be collected for subsequent use. And in fact there are various commercial equipment that are available to do size reduction using acoustic technology. At lab scale ultrasonic homogenizers are widely used. These are essentially mixers. So they are more used for the purpose of dispersion. When you have a nano suspension as we have repeatedly said one of the biggest challenges is to keep the particles dispersed in suspension. As an ultrasonic homogenizer essentially works by imparting an acoustic a high frequency acoustic field to the suspension which constantly keeps it mixed and keeps the particles well segregated. At pilot scale the same ultrasonic disperser can look like this. So it uses pretty much the same principle except that it is now at a slightly larger scale that can be used to process liters per hour of suspension volume. And you can keep scaling this up to industrial scale and there are industrial scale ultrasonic dispersers that are in the market today. 
and they have what is known as a flow cell. So this is basically the continuous throughput kind of system that I had sketched a couple of slides ago where the suspension containing micron sized particles are, is constantly being pumped through a flow cell where the suspension is exposed to an ultrasonic field and size reduction happens. So in this case you can set up a process by which you are constantly pumping in micron sized suspensions and drawing out submicron and, and nano dimensional suspensions. Now ultrasonication can be done in two ways. One is the single pass mode and again this is actually a, a commercially available setup that is marketed by a company called Hilscher in Germany. And you can see here that essentially you have a flow cell into which you are pumping liquid from tank one. Size reduction happens and the output from the flow cell is then collected in tank two. So this is essentially a single pass type of an arrangement where material is taken from tank one, exposed to ultrasound, and then the outlet goes into a collection tank, tank two. In continuous recirculation mode, this arrangement can be modified so that you, you also build in the ability to recycle material. So here, there's a single tank in which material is stored, which is pumped to the flow cell and size reduction happens. And the solution is then pumped back into the tank. The difference between this and the concept of beaker decantation that I had sketched earlier is in this arrangement there is no active separation of the nano size particles and the larger size particles. So in, 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 in some ways this is kind of an inefficient arrangement because you are you're recycling everything from the flow cell. So even particles that have already been size reduced will be exposed to further ultrasound which kind of defeats the purpose. So by combining this setup with a provision for doing beaker decantation and automatic separation of particles by size, you can improve the efficiency of this process by several degrees. Okay, so, so far what we have been talking about is essentially synthesis of nanoparticles and using bottom up as well as top down approaches. And we have briefly indicated some characterization techniques that are used to follow the efficiency of these processes. Because when you talk about nano, nano synthesis, the primary morphological characteristics are size and shape. And we have seen some examples of how these can be characterized. However, the challenge still remains once you have synthesized nanoparticles, how do you keep them in their nano form? So dispersion is an important consideration in colloidal suspensions as well as composite materials. So particle dispersion needs to happen in fluids as well as in solids. So when we talk about particle dispersion in fluids, we are primarily talking about suspensions of nanoparticles, mostly in liquids, and how we can keep these nanoparticles separate and apart from each other during their storage. Whereas when we talk about nanoparticle dispersion in composites, we are talking about dispersing the nanoparticles uniformly in a solid surface like for example a polymer. And so these are two different again interesting challenges and techniques that work for keeping particles uniformly dispersed in solutions are also of some importance to keeping them dispersed in solid surfaces. However, there are some find differences between the two as well as we will see. And the other thing that we would note is that characterization techniques that were particularly useful for monitoring size reduction in, in nanoparticle synthesis are not always the same techniques that are used to characterize dispersion of nanoparticles. We really use a different set of techniques to monitor dispersion compared to size reduction. So when you talk about nanoparticles in suspension, the cohesive tendency is something that we always have to deal with. And we have discussed this quite extensively in previous lectures. So when you have hydrophobic particles in water, as we saw earlier, they will tend to attract. 
when you have hydrophilic particles in water, they will tend to repel each other because they have more affinity for water molecules. So surfactant coating of nanoparticles in suspensions will help keep them apart. Now in terms of dynamic behavior of nanoparticles in suspension, because of the tendency to agglomerate, the mean size will always increase with time and the total number will always decrease with time. And we have previously looked at equations that govern the kinetics of this process. So the, to characterize the dynamic behavior of particles in suspension requires population balance modeling, which will take into account formation of particle clusters by the mechanism of agglomeration, as well as the breakup of clusters of molecules through the dispersion process. Now in general, because nanoparticles have a tendency to attach, you need to disperse them just before processing. So for example, if you're trying to make nano fertilizers and you want to add some nanoparticles into your fertilizer to make it more effective, it's better to disperse these nanoparticles into your fertilizer product just before you're ready to seal up the fertilizer in bags and ship them to customers. Dispersion is something that has to be done virtually just in time. If you, if you do dispersion very early in your process, by the time you get to the end of the process, the particles would have reattached. So it doesn't really help much. Nanoparticles and composites, again, uniformity of distribution is the key issue. Nanocomposites, as we know, have some wonderful properties in terms of increased wear resistance, in, in terms of increased conductivities, in terms of um, uh, increased um, strength and so on. However, they all rely on uniform distribution of the nanomaterials in the polymer matrix. If the particles cluster, that can lead to uneven properties. So you may have high strength in one area and low strength in, in other areas. Bridging can also result in negation of nanoscale properties. You are relying on the nanoparticles to be present in isolated form in order to achieve the property enhancements that you're looking for. If you allow particles to cluster or bridge, it can defeat the purpose. Higher volume percent may be required when distribution is non-uniform. One of the main attractions of using nano additives is that for the same volume of material, you can get a much greater enhancement when you use it in nano form because of the increased surface area per unit volume. However, if the distribution is not uniform, then you lose that advantage and you have to increase the volume percent of material that you use, so the cost advantage is lost. So here, particularly when you're making nano composite polymers, uniform dispersion of nanoparticles in the polymer melt is an absolute requirement and it should be done just prior to molding the plastic material. Now previously we have discussed how interparticle adhesion forces vary as a function of particle size, interparticle distance and so on. Here is a, a, a chart from Drelick et al. 2006 that shows the force per radius of the particle versus the distance of separation between the particles. And you can see that in general, there is a decreasing trend as particles move away from each other. So the implication of this for cohesion is that if you have a more dilute suspension, your chances of avoiding cohesion are much better. But as the particle concentration in suspension increases and the interparticle distance decreases, the forces of adhesion between the particles becomes much larger. Agglomeration kinetics, we have reviewed this in one of the earlier lectures. For a monodispersed population, that is populations containing particles of a single size, 1 over Ni as a function of time equals 1 over N0 as a function of time plus 4K TT CC by 3 mu, where CC is the stokes cunningham correction factor, mu is viscosity, uh, uppercase T is temperature, lowercase T is time, N0 is the number of particles at time equal to 0 and Ni is the number of particles at time equals T. You can see from this equation that agglomeration is accelerated at higher temperatures 
over longer time durations. And when, when the viscosity is lower, there is an increased agglomeration tendency. And of course, smaller sizes lead to higher cohesive behavior. And again, we have previously reviewed cohesive forces between particles, which can be looked at as a sum of Van der Waals forces, electrostatic forces, capillary forces, viscous forces, and contact forces. And we have seen the expressions for these forces. The Van der Waals force goes as it's, it's proportional to the radius of the particle and inversely proportional to the square of the distance of separation. The electrostatic forces go as Q and Q2 by 4 pi epsilon or epsilon 0 S squared. And we have looked at the expressions for capillary forces, which are a sum of surface tension and pressure forces, and viscous forces, which are the sum of normal and tangential viscous forces, and contact forces, which are the sum of normal contact forces and tangential contact forces. These equations we have reviewed quite extensively in earlier lectures. Now the net result of all these forces is mixing. Now when we talk about particles in suspension, there are two aspects of particle distribution and dispersion that we need to look at. When we talk about dispersion, that's only one part of it. If you look at these figures A, B, C, and D, here A represents both poor distribution as well as poor dispersion. What we mean by that is the particles are clustered, which implies poor dispersion. And also, these clusters are not uniformly distributed in the suspension or the matrix. So distribution is poor as well. So the top left-hand quadrant represents kind of the worst case, poor dispersion and poor mixing. Now case B actually represents good distribution. The particles are clustered, but the clusters themselves are well distributed, uniformly distributed. So this is a case where you have good distribution, but poor dispersion. And then you have case C, which is the inverse. You have actually good dispersion. The particles are not clustered. They are not agglomerated. However, they are not uniformly distributed. So these are examples of good dis dispersion but poor distribution. So ideally, the scenario that we want to achieve is shown in D, which shows good distribution and good dispersion. The particles are all present as isolated discrete particles. So there is no dispersion. I mean, there is no agglomeration or cohesion, and also all the particles are well distributed in the matrix that we are looking at. So this combination of good dispersion and good distribution is what we try to achieve, whether we are trying to make nanoparticles in suspension or nanocomposite materials. So what are some methods of dispersion of nanoparticles in suspensions and composites? Well, the most common methods are stirring, orbital shaking, and sonication. As you can imagine, in, a, in the stirring process, you essentially use a, a stirrer, whether it's a magnetic stirrer or an electrical stirrer or otherwise, to keep the suspension well stirred so that the particles are uniformly distributed and dispersed. An orbital shaker essentially provides a centrifugal force, which can again prevent particles from becoming dispersed. And finally, sonication, as we have seen earlier, in addition to providing high cavitation intensity for fragmenting particles, the fields associated with uh, sonication can also keep the particles well dispersed in solution. Another interesting process for dispersion is to use supercritical fluids for this purpose. Essentially, a supercritical fluid is one that combines some of the properties of a gas with some of the properties of a liquid. So it has the high viscosity that characterizes a liquid, but it has high, the high diffusivity that characterizes a gas. So here you can 
take advantage of the high diffusivities in order to make the nanoparticles disperse very well in solution. And you can make use of the high viscosities to keep the particles in place once they are dispersed. So here essentially you achieve your dispersion and, and distribution in a two step process and use the high density and viscosity of the supercritical fluid to keep the particles in, in place once you have dispersed them. Magnetic dispersion will work for particles that are magnetizable. So if you are trying to make a composite material that has magnetic nanoparticles or you have a solution of magnetic particles in suspension, you can keep them segregated, dispersed by appropriately applying a magnetic field. Another technique that can be used for dispersion of nanoparticles which is particularly effective in the gas phase is electrospray. So here you intentionally induce a charge on the particles and since a particle charge that is being induced is the same whether it is a plus or a minus, all the particles will have the same charge and therefore there will be automatically a repulsive field set up between the particles. So by inducing like charges on nanoparticles in uh, gas phase, you can essentially combat the tendency to agglomerate and keep the particles well separated. A high pressure homogenizer with magnetron sputtering is another example of achieving a high level of dispersion. So here essentially what you are doing is providing energy to the particles. The, when, you have, when you energize the particles, they have a tendency to reach an equilibrium state and this equilibrium state essentially will require that they establish positions that are separated from each other. And so by combining high pressure homogenization with a magnetron sputtering process, you can energize the particles and make them reach an equilibrium position that is well dispersed in the suspension. Spray drying is another example of particle dispersion. In a, in a spray dryer essentially you take a liquid suspension and accelerate it through a nozzle and you expose it to the co-current or counter-current flow of a hot gas. Now as you do that the excess water will evaporate and you will get a structure that looks like what on the right hand side. So the spray dried granules themselves tend to be very uniform in size. However, in the conventional spray drying process, unless you add a dispersant, they will tend to agglomerate into clusters. So when you combine spray drying either with sonication to do downstream dispersion or with the addition of a dispersant which will essentially coat on these particles and keep them dispersed, you can obtain well dispersed nanoparticles by using spray drying as the method of obtaining these particles. Another process that is used to get well dispersed nanoparticles is called aerosol assisted direct incorporation. So here you first prepare a dispersion of the nanoparticles in a precursor solution and then convert it into an aerosol because an aerosol is essentially a suspension of droplets in air. So by introducing air into the solution containing the nanoparticles, you can make a, dro a, a, a droplet aerosol and then you heat it to evaporate the solvent and then you take it through a filter to produce nanoparticles that are of a well contained size range and then you directly impact the surface on which you are trying to deposit these nanoparticles. For example, this may be a porous surface into which you are trying to uh, install these nanoparticles. So in this case, you will take the aerosols that are coming out of this chamber and directly impact the surface with these materials and obtain a functionalized mesoporous particle substance. The primary consideration here is that you want the aerosol to impact the surface 
as a line of sight phenomenon, so that individual particles get captured in individual pores. So, here the, the porosity of the substrate is used to keep the particles segregated. Once the particles get incorporated in these pores, they really cannot move around anymore and find each other. And finally, ultrasonic dispersion is something that uh, many have looked at. In ultrasonic dispersion, you combine ultrasonics with a liquid phase in order to achieve both size reduction as well as dispersion. And you, as you can see in this uh, schematic, you can achieve both the size reduction as well as uniform dispersion and, and distribution by utilizing an ultrasonic technology. This is a schematic of a two-step powder dispersion using sonication. Again, this is for zinc oxide nanoparticles, where essentially in step one, you are using the ultrasound to produce nano sized zinc oxide particles. And then in step two or B, you are using higher frequency ultrasonics to disperse these zinc oxide nanoparticles uniformly in suspension. There are many literature citations on ultrasonic dispersion, particularly in nanocomposites. And these are a couple of examples, polymer clay nanocomposites and also natural and synthesized aluminum based composite materials, which are very effectively produced by using sono technology. When we look at the sono blending process, how do you characterize dispersion efficiency? Again, coming back to the main theme of this course, characterization. Unless you can quantify the degree of dispersion, you cannot really measure it or control it or optimize it. So we are constantly looking for ways to characterize dispersion efficiency. So we'll look at some methods of doing this quantitative characterization. One method simply utilizes turbidity measurements. As we have seen before, Turbidity is a measure of particle scattering cross section in a liquid. So suppose you take a liquid in which particles are suspended, divide it into two layers and measure the turbidity of each layer separately. The more uniformly the particles are dispersed, the closer should be these turbidity values. So that is a very simple concept that's used here where we take a suspension of nanoparticles and these are as they are manufactured, so there's been no effort to blend them very well, for example, using high frequency ultrasonics. And you measure the turbidity of level one and level two of the suspension. And you can see that the turbidity values are very, very different in these two cases between the two levels, which is indicative of the fact that the particles are not well dispersed in solution. Now, suppose we take the same suspension and apply 58 kilohertz ultrasonics to blend the particles, to mix them, to disperse them. And then we again do these measurements. And now we are looking at sono blending time versus the turbidity. And you can see that the turbidity values for level one and level two are now much, much closer, indicating that the particles are now well dispersed in solution. In fact, uh, 30 minutes of sonication appears to be optimal in this case. Uh, and the turbidity values for level one and level two are virtually equal. And this is uh, an example of doing the same blending with higher frequency ultrasonics. And here we see that even at 30, 15 minutes of blending, we are able to achieve virtual equality between the turbidity values of level one and level two. So here we are simply using turbidity of the suspension as the characteristic of dispersion. And we are able to show that by increasing the frequency of the ultrasound, you can achieve efficient dispersion sooner compared to lower frequency ultrasound. So you can actually use this type of data to optimize the sono blending time as a function of frequency. By going to a blending frequency of 132 kilohertz, you can actually achieve blending much faster than trying to do this at a lower frequency. So here, the characteristic of particle dispersion is simply equalizing the turbidity of suspensions 
at various levels. And here we are looking at an optimized sono blending time again as a function of ultrasonic frequency. The difference between this graph and the previous graph is the in the synthesis part. Here we are doing the ultrasound in two parts. We are first using ultrasound to synthesize nanoparticles and then again using higher frequency ultrasound to disperse the nanoparticles. And it appears from, from these graphs that 58 kilohertz is optimal for synthesizing nanoparticles and 132 kilohertz is optimum for dispersing these nanoparticles. This is again uh, a way to represent blending efficiency or dispersion efficiency simply by taking the ratio of the particle concentrations in the two levels. And here we can see that as we increase the sono blending time, the difference between the stabilities of the suspensions goes to virtually zero after only 15 minutes. This, the index that is shown on the vertical axis here is actually the difference in concentrations between particles in the two layers. So zero here is the optimum value, the ideal value. The sooner you can get to zero, the better. So here you can see that with sono blending, you can achieve uniform dispersion within 15 minutes. And this is for the case of silicon carbide, again plotting ultrasonic frequency in kilohertz on the x-axis and the optimum sono blending time on the vertical axis. And here we can see that a combination of frequencies, a low and a high, 58 kilohertz and 192 kilohertz is the optimum setting for achieving a low value in sono blending time. Now extending this to the formulation of composites, again what we see is that when we have nano dimensional particles that are inserted into a polymer matrix, they can certainly enhance erosion resistance. Here again we are using turbidity as a characteristic of erosion resistance of the material. The way this testing is done is by taking the material exposing it to ultrasonics for various times and looking at particles that are generated due to the ultrasonic field, which are, which are reflected in the turbidity values. So here a lower turbidity value is indicated of higher erosion resistance. So here you can see that if you plot turbidity as a function of sonication time, when you have nanoparticle inserts, the erosion values are lower compared to without the inserts. And here we are looking at erosion resistance in terms of mass loss, which is a more conventional way of measuring erosion resistance of materials. So here we are looking at mass loss as a function of sonication time. And here again we see that the insertion of nanoparticles into a polymer matrix increases its erosion resistance significantly. The, pol the particle size distribution of these alumina inserts is shown here. The mean size here is of the order of roughly 1.5 microns and there is a substantial fraction of these particles that are below a micron. As you can see, the, the lower part of the distribution has a tail that extends all the way to about 0.2 microns. And these are some scanning electron microscopy pictures on how the PMMA polymer matrix looks with particle reinforcement. This is with um, 10 micron resolution. And this again is uh, the same material with particle reinforcement with 20 micron resolution. And this is a, another picture of the material showing the, the alumina particles dispersed and distributed in the matrix and this is shown at 10 micron resolution with a scanning electron microscope. So ultimately what is a, the best indicator of dispersion uniformity in composite materials? How do you assess how uniform is the dispersion? Well the pictures that we saw in the last three slides are qualitative in nature. By looking at them you can get a feel for dispersion but you cannot quantify it very well. 
So a procedure that is used to quantify dispersion is as follows. You have to select 50 areas at random from the SEM pictures or from the sample and then examine these areas using microscopy. So depending on the size range of the particles, you may choose to use optical microscopy or scanning electron microscopy or tunneling electron microscopy. You count the number of nanoparticles in each of these areas, calculate the mean number and the standard deviation. If the standard deviation is less than 10 percent of the mean, you can consider the dispersion to be adequately uniform because this results in a variability coefficient of less than or equal to 0.1 where variability coefficient is defined as standard deviation divided by the mean. So when we quantify nanoparticle dispersion in terms of its variability coefficient and we compare various methods of dispersion, now you can start to quantify dispersion much better. So here you see that mechanical mixing results in a very high variability coefficient which is indicative of poor dispersion whereas 430 kilohertz ultrasonics and 470 kilohertz ultrasonics show improved dispersion resulting in lower variability coefficients. However, if you look at our dual frequency mixing which combines low frequency cavitational mixing with high frequency acoustic streaming based mixing, you can see that the variability coefficient is below 0.1. So in this way, we can quantify dispersion efficiency and conclusively show that an ultrasonic dispersion process which combines elements of cavitation with elements of streaming is optimum for obtaining a well dispersed solution. And this is reflected in data as well. For example, if you take a <coughs> polystyrene nano alumina composite and you study the impact strength, here we are plotting the filler content versus impact strength and you will see that there is no significant effect when the dispersion is be, being done using 470 kilohertz as the ultrasonic frequency. At 430 kilohertz, you start, start to see some increased effect of filler loading. It appears that 0.4 percent filler loading is optimal and results in a increased impact strength compared to the virgin material as well as other filler volume percentages. But if you do the high low dual frequency which we had previously quantified as giving the best dispersion, you can see that based on the impact strength data as well, this has the best functional effect. So there is good correlation between our dispersion index that we had previously developed and the functional values that are provided by these additive materials. So when we are trying to do dispersion of nanoparticles, some of the challenges are polydispersity. Particles have very different sizes. Separation of micron and submicron size particles is always an issue. Keeping the lower dimensional particles in a dispersed state is a challenge. The post blending period where when you dry the particles, the particles stick to the wall of the beaker or to each other is again a challenge. And finally, reinforcing the submicron and nano dimensional particles into the polymer matrix is another huge challenge. But it turns out that by using a combination of low frequency and high frequency ultrasound, you can overcome all these challenges and produce a well dispersed suspension of particles or a well dispersed nano composite material. So to summarize what we have been talking about, sonothin synthesis and processing offers several advantages. Sono fragmentation can produce well rounded particles in the 1 to 300 nanometer size range. Sono blending is an effective method to disperse these particles and sono dispersion is an effective method to prepare uh, polymer composites of very uniform properties. Sub 100 nanometer particle generation still needs optimization uh, but scale up is not an issue. One of the big advantages we have is increased concentrations actually increase fragmentation efficiency. So we'll stop this at this point and in the next lecture we will particularly focus in on the properties of nanoparticles and how to characterize them. Any questions? <laughs>
see you at the next lecture then.